Hello and welcome to Transforming Tomorrow, the podcast from the Pentman Centre for Sustainability in Business here at Lancaster University Management School. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jan Bebbington. Now Jan, we're going to be diving deep into data and discussing how much you can trust it today. And I think that's a good place to go and follows on really nicely from our, our podcast last week with Dee, who was looking at how people are using information and the extent to which it might be informing their decisions and their understandings about the world. And with us to discuss this, we're welcoming Lauren Thornton, a research associate with the Pentland Centre, who specialises in data and the trustworthy data and frameworks. Welcome, Lauren. Hi. Lauren, first of all, can you tell us a little bit about your academic background and how it relates to sustainability? Yep. So I originally started doing political science. So I specialised in democracy and elections. And I was particularly interested in social movements, protests and how politics is talked about within the media and how it's presented to people. And then following that, I came to Lancaster and started doing data science. And I was always more interested in the social and environmental aspects of data science. And then my thesis continued that with specifically looking at environmental data science and then moving to this job as well with Jan. It all it all kind of leads into one another. What's quite interesting there is that that background in politics and trust in people and trust in information and their processes flow over into a data science interest as well. And I must confess, I, I, I know that you're from data science, but I don't really know what data science <laughs> encompasses, if I can confess that right here and now. So could you give us just a, a, a brief outline of... What's encompassed within data science? It's a blend of basic simple regression models that you would be used to in maths and stats all the way up to artificial intelligence. So that's what Turing used to work on and then neural networks and things like that now. So now we know what data science is about. I'd like to talk about trust and particularly Mm -hmm. your work on trust affordances because that's where we're collaborating and where I think it's a really interesting set of concepts um, that people take for granted but actually are much more complex. Complicated. So can you tell us about trust and then trust affordances? Yep. So um, trust is quite subjective and idiosyncratic and contextual. So everyone in this room will have a different version of what trust means to them and then it, that will change for di- uh, different contexts. So I study trust as in the positive expectation that someone will, that I, if I trust you, Jan, to do X, that I have a positive expectation that you will do X for me and I can trust you to do that. And it's always important when there's uncertainty or risk involved, that's when trust really comes into play. So if there wasn't any uncertainty or risk then I wouldn't really need to trust you it would be more confident but of course the world being the world there usually is some kind of uncertainty or risk and then so trust affordances was developed during my thesis when I came to realize that there are a lot of models of trust in the literature but none of them kind of got me to where I wanted to go in terms of designing a system. So the concept of affordances does already exist. It was developed from psychology and then it was taken and put into human and computer interaction studies. So the basic example would be that stairs afford climbability, but that's based on your perception of how steep they are, how big the steps are, or a cat door affords you the op- the opportunity for a cat to enter but it would not afford the opportunity for a human to enter so i took that aspect of affordances and then thought about it in terms of trust so what would one feature of a technology provide the opportunity for trust for one person and how might this be different for another person? So I thought of it as different trust affordances existing and tried to characterise them within different categories. So, for instance, for transparency, the opportunity to scrutinise things would be an affordance and would be a trust affordance because it's providing the opportunity for someone to assess trustworthiness and then to decide themselves whether to place trust. What I really like about that before passing over to to Paul is that sometimes people say that sort of almost have it like an on off switch you either trust or you don't trust but what you're talking about when you talk about the affordances is a much more complicated picture of trust but also how do different elements come together in order to create some level of trustworthiness so it's not an on or off variable but it's a more continuous variable with lots of elements to it. Yes 100% I actually 
within my work as well, not only did I think about trust affordances as a thing that we can do in design, but also as a way of thinking about trust. So I very much advocate for thinking in a very nuanced and contextual manner. It's not black or white, there are shades of grey. And also that what is for one person may not work for another person and also that there'll be lots of different things that all intersect at different... It's very much like a jigsaw puzzle and getting everything right for one user, but knowing that that is not going to be right for another user. So it's how to how can we design for that whilst being very specific and niche, but then still putting that into a general parsimonious model for a system. Is it always the highest level of trust that you're aiming for? Or would there be a target level of trust? You're not necessarily wanting every single person in the whole world to trust everything about a certain thing. You're wanting a certain level of trust on a certain area. Yes, and realistically, we only want people to trust when something's trustworthy. So we are not aiming for trust when something isn't trustworthy because that would be bad. And it's also not telling someone you should trust this 90% because a lot of a lot of work I did at the start of my PhD was around like recommender systems. So people were theorising that users would trust something if they were told this is 90% trustworthy. But that soon unravels when you realise that what even is 90% trustworthy and how do, you, <laughs> how do you actually quantify that? So I take the stance that it's all very much user-defined and it's based on their perceptions. So would that depend very much then upon the audience you were aiming at? So yes. yeah, yeah, the, the people you're expecting to be users, they'll always be unexpected users in any system, but the users you're expecting? Yes, even that's a big challenge in itself because how you divide a system up into different stakeholders is extremely challenging. And then knowing that whatever group of people you talk to are never going to be 100% representative of a group anyway. And I really like the um, you identified that there might be trustworthy design. So clearly there are some design principles that could be used that will, will lead to actual trustworthiness as well as perceived trustworthiness. What, what kind of design principles come into play? There is work that is called trustworthy by design and that takes its basis from computer science in which there's also things like security by design and value sensitive design so trustworthy by design is really thinking that okay we want to build a system that's trustworthy you can't retrofit it it has to be thought about from the outset and then throughout the process and then forevermore and contained within it. Principles wise, it's very much mixed and everyone's got a very different opinion on it. I'm always slightly concerned when someone goes, ah, oh, I've got this person I know who studies trust and I'm like, oh no. <laughs> I m- might not necessarily agree with them on how they study trust. So yes, it's a very variable design space and the fact that it Every discipline studies it completely differently. Mm -hmm. And so there were very many different definitions, different ways of studying it, different beliefs in whether you can actually quantitatively study it or not. So, yeah, it's there's a very, very varied. And what I like about uh, that is that it crosses over to someone we spoke to earlier in this, this series, Paul, um, D. Wang, who was talking about um, sustainability reporting. And we were, we got on to talking about uh, greenwashing. Mm-hmm. And then that, that you, know, you could imagine that we were talking about, you know, does a report, is it trustworthy by design? And I think he was telling us no. Um, <laughs> but then also whether or not there would be trust affordances. So I think this is, this is an idea that doesn't sit purely with the data data sciences, but travels in several other of the areas that we've had Pentland Centre members talk about as well. Tying that in then with data around sustainability. Sustainability is such a contentious issue in some regards, politically especially. When it comes to data and data trustworthiness and trust affordances within sustainability data, how does that work and how important is it? It's extremely important. Obviously, I think a lot of things to do with environmental and sustainability data. I think one of the main barriers for the area as a whole has been that there is uncertainty and people can use that to back up their arguments, whether they be right or not. And I think that as scientists, you know that things aren't are always refutable, but you know that if there's consensus on something, then that's probably right, regardless of whether one measurement's debatable or not but a further point would be that there are no longer a lot of the work I study is collaborative research so everyone coming to this is not an expert in the field and so having trust in data to an extent that you can trust that it's right and that you can use it in your work is really important but I think that 
we were so used to thinking as only experts knowing everything and knowledge equating to trust that developing trust in data now as we move to more multidisciplinary work is going to be important but I don't have answers as to how we do that. This Jan says speaks so much to the discussion myself and yourself had about wicked problems, clumsy solutions, post-normal science and how there aren't always perfect answers to every question and how from what Warren was saying there is oh people can use data to maybe back up a false argument which is the question I asked you about you know, post-truth and uh, everything where people just use data to say anything they want it to say, even if it's not necessarily using it properly. And that's why these kind of concepts are so important. But also we use them every day and and we use them in research projects every day. But actually having a deep and nuanced understanding about how they're put together is really important. The other thing I really like about the work that you do, Lauren, is that we've um, had quite a few people talk about socio-ecological systems and how they're researching it and how these two systems tie together. But your research then is because it's got that intersection between people and then information systems and the kind of um, you know architecture that generates data out of those systems, you're working with socio-technical systems. And that's such a groovy term. And I was wondering if you could tell our listeners a little bit about what a socio-technical system is. That's the first time I've heard the word groovy used since (laughs) I last watched Austin Powers. Thank you for that. Um, So socio-technical systems is a method of design that takes into account a user's organisational setting, their social setting and cultural settings, and takes the practices as well that they're used to doing in their job and then designing for that. So a lot of the field does focus on management, but then a lot of the field does focus on computing as well. So within the computing domain, which I focus on, it'll be things like user experience and things like that. So it's not just it's not just the philosophy where build it and they will come. It's more that we develop it in line with intended users and that makes a better system overall it also is a method of thinking so for instance the fact that data is not innately neutral objective things like that it actually is value laden there are assumptions based in data and how it's collected and that traditionally we can understand those assumptions so if I'm an ecologist for instance I know that someone is going into the field and measuring in quadrats for example I know the the methodology that they'll follow and so I can account for the fact that maybe they've counted one thing wrong or something like that but now if we're moving into this more multidisciplinary ways of working we don't always know that and I think like I was having a conversation with someone who was talking about the height of trees and they said this wouldn't be interesting to anyone else but for me I would like to know how far off the ground were they starting that measurement at and was there any leeway in that because that affects even though it may only be millimeters to them that level of detail is extremely important Um, and so I like that way of thinking about the world in general but also data it's you know it's never perfect and it's never just data. How does that sit with you as an accountant, Jan, <laughs> that data is not perfect? I guess a, a key part of accountancy is being as close to perfect as you can be. Uh, well, that, that's that's a myth. So <laughs> oh. I don't want to offend any of our accounting listeners, but I think one of the things that we know from accounting, and we sort of absorb it within our own expectation, is that other than the cash figure, a lot of the other figures are quite contextual and quite fuzzy. And so in that respect, one of the reasons why I really enjoy uh, working alongside Lauren is that we have the same language between data design and accounting, but we've ended up understanding quite different things about them and they're applied in quite different settings. Although Lauren's work it could be applied in an accounting setting, I think accounting work could be applied so much in, in um, broader settings. So when we think about data... We think about transparency being great, Mm -hmm. but then we're not really entirely clear (laughs) how much transparency is great and there's too Mm -hmm. much transparency. Or too little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's the green hushing, green washing that that. we discussed with Dee as well. Yeah. 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 So in that respect, we have a lot of the same terms and the language is more or less the same. The terms describing the same characteristics, but they're standing in quite different places in, in terms of that contextual understanding. It's hugely energising and synergistic to think about accounting data through the lens that Lauren's talking about today. That's a great way to bring us on to translucency, because we talk about transparency, 
but you're focusing in your work on translucency, Lauren, for a start. What the hell does translucency mean? (laughs) So I like to think of translucency as the middle way between complete transparency and complete opacity. So I like to think of it as you'll have normal windows that you can see through clearly, but then you'll have a bathroom window that's frosted glass perhaps, and you can see shapes through it, but you can't always see detail. And that's how I think of translucency. And how I think it relates for both Jan and my perspective is that transparency is often given as a precursor to accountability and trust. So through the provision of information, most typically, the work that Jan and I have been doing over the past year, I've started look, looking from an accountabil- accounting perspective. And what do we mean when we say transparency? I think is quite interesting. And also there's this notion of meaningful transparency. So if you, Paul, asked me to give you, I don't know, information on my company's practices, I give you 500 pages of thing and they go here you go I'm being completely transparent here's everything that doesn't necessarily mean anything to you and you would spend a lot of time combing through to find that one thing that you wanted to find and you might not even find it because it's intentionally buried so I think that to some people giving over all of that information would be them being transparent to the user but whether that's actually useful to the user and meaningful is completely different. And so I think that translucency kind of works as this halfway between finding out what people are actually inquiring about and then providing them that information along with any of the extra additional information that they would need, i.e. to prove that what you've said is true. Because I don't think that just the provision of information itself is actually useful. Uh, uh, my question was going to be which is better translucency or transparency but i'm guessing at points here it depends again on your audience because it might be for certain audiences having all the information is important but for other audiences they are like you say just going to be bombarded with stuff that they can't understand yeah yeah definitely and i think that transparency is kind of held up as this gold standard of transparency is perfect if we just do if we just do transparency however we define transparency then yeah that's good but I think rather than them being two different concepts in my mind they're just two different versions of providing the same outcome or the same practice. That's very cool and this uh, these nuances really really matter. So Lauren you're working with myself but also with other people that we will hear later on the podcast including uh, Alona Armstrong from Energy Lancaster and we're working together on a project called Trustworthy and Accountable Decision Support Frameworks for Biodiversity a virtual labs approach. And there's so much tied up in that one title that I might uh, start from the last bit and get you to explain to us what a virtual lab is and then come back and have a look at what that project entails. So what is a virtual lab and why might they be useful? So a virtual lab is and can be referenced multiple different ways. So virtual lab is a concept, but they might also be, or the audience might also be familiar with the term collaborative research environment data research infrastructure, they all kind of basically mean a virtual laboratory, which is a virtual lab. And so at its simplest level, a virtual lab provides a user with the ability to conduct experiments, to draw together different data sets, to do modelling and to perform analyses and to present them to a wide range of stakeholders. But crucially, this occurs in the cloud, if you will. So It's not software that you have to download. It's not a high-end computer that you have to go and sit at and access. It is available through a browser. And one of the instantiations of this is at UKCEH, so the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And they have data labs, which are real-life examples of virtual labs. And so you can perform any manner of scientific research within these virtual labs. And how are they going to be used in in the project on trustworthy and accountable decision support frameworks for biodiversity? So within the project, we have a dedicated team working on virtual labs and they are going to do everything throughout the science pipeline in a virtual lab. So this will be drawing in the different data sets, using these to model different land management practices and how they can contribute to 
positively enhancing biodiversity. And then after this has been done, virtual labs can also be used to present the information in various different layers of abstraction. So this could be providing a scientist with everything that exists. This goes back to the translucency question, but it can also be used to create interactive plots of data that users can play around with themselves or to provide almost like a report at the end that would say, you know, like if you did this, a likely forecast against different biodiversity variables would be this. And that'll be really handy as you're trying to make some of those land management decisions. So in the project, what kind of decisions are being modelled? What kind of decisions are people wanting to make? So we are looking at two different case studies and we're focusing on different energy and agricultural producers. And we're taking a multi-objective approach to biodiversity and land management in this sense that we we appreciate that there are already people either producing energy through solar parks or having agricultural businesses businesses and then it's about giving them the information to make decisions on the different land management practices that they could do and how these would benefit biodiversity and link into government schemes such as environmental land management. So that have you seen Lauren positive signs in terms of how transparency, translucency, trustworthiness in data and data frameworks how have you seen positive signs for how that is developing and maybe what it looks like going into the future? I'd say yes and no. So yes, all the people that I talk to are always very receptive to the idea, are always rec- recognising that it's important. And I think that the the more that time goes on and the more conversations I have, I am noticing that everyone tends to reiterate the things that I found in my thesis, which is good. But I think that, especially in this, in this role that I'm in now, I am looking to project what I've found in the past and put that into practice, which is ostensibly quite difficult. I think that nothing's ever going to be perfect, but I think that there is a lot that we could do in this area. And I think that in the future, it will be more a result of embedded research within different organisations and within different businesses and within different development of system processes. I don't think there's ever going to be a recipe that I could publish and other people could enact. You've got to kind of do all of this extra work to understand the specific context as well. So I would say it's definitely promising, but I've done quite a bit of work in it and we just need to progress now to the other side of things. And that brings me right back to a very, very early podcast we had from Katie Mason, who was looking at 5G in rural areas in uh, Yorkshire. And if, for example, I'm sure that um, there's some of the common base there. I, I got a sense of practice theory as I'm infusing both her work but also what Lauren has been talking about as well. And again, that trustworthiness by design, really thinking about the specific location, uh, making sure that people that matter in the process are able to be a part of it, etc. So it seems to me that it's a really lovely tying together, but with some really specific concepts that, and it really matters how you define and execute them. And just as with Lauren saying, uh, Katie was a big driver of that and it needed someone there who was getting involved in the process. You need to get more people and more people involved in it so that it it snowballs over and therefore it becomes inbuilt in more things. And that 5G system was a technical system, but she was doing the social part of a socio-technical system. Um, so that's really hard to say. <laughs> Maybe it's very hard to listen to as well, but, but, um, but you know what I mean. Thank you very much for joining us, Lauren. That's been fascinating to hear about all of your work there, and I really appreciate you coming in. Thank you. And next time, we'll be joined by one of your partners on that virtual lab, because Alona Armstrong, who is the director of Energy Lancaster, is going to be here in the studio with us. That'll be fab. And so until next time, if you do have any questions, please email us, pentlandcentre at lancaster.ac.uk. So we'll see you when Alona joins us. I'm Paul Turner. And I'm Professor Jane Babington.